Thanks so much for joining with us online today. We pray that this would be beneficial and impactful for your life. We also hope that you wouldn't just consume our content, but really consider contributing to what we're trying to do here in North Iowa. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can go to www.rhythmchurch.org as we try to accomplish our mission of helping people find and follow the real Jesus. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining with us today. We're in a series called Beyond the 52, and we're looking at this idea of what it looks like um, of living out our faith more than what we do here on Sunday. And I mentioned in week one of this series that I am really am believing that this could be a turning point for our church if we really get this, if we do this well, if we are a people that live out our faith Monday through Saturday and don't just attend church on Sunday. It could be a revolutionary moment in the life of our church. And we really do want to be a church that's not just seating people, but sending people. And just to recap a little bit of what we talked about um, in week one, a little bit of context, um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how we can't just show up on Sunday and then walk past people on Monday. That isn't following Jesus. If the extent of your faith each week is just to attend a church service, you aren't really following Jesus. You're just religious. And we want a group of people that are committed Christ followers and a group of people that are actually following Jesus. And in week one, again, we talked about how Jesus was asked by a religious leader, hey, what does it take to get into the kingdom of heaven? Or what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, he says, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but you also need to love your neighbor as yourself. And that was really the heart behind this series, is we can't just get the theology right. We can't just do the church thing and get love wrong. We can't do that. We have to love God and our neighbor if we want to inherit eternal life. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to love God and to love our neighbors well. And I will admit, I think at Rhythm, we do a good job. We really do a good job of loving our neighbors. We're always partnering, partnering with local organizations to meet the needs of people. But I will say, I think, again, part of this series is that I hope that you're not waiting on us for those projects or to meet those needs. You need to be doing it every day of the week, right where you are, meeting the needs of the people around you each and every day. And speaking of every day, living out your faith every day, we get a sneak peek into what this looked like in the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the Bible, it's really just short for the Acts of the Apostles. And it, what it is, is this book that tells an account of the first church. It gives us a look into how the first church began. And this is really um, cool because obviously this was you know, a couple thousand years ago. And, and I want to read a portion of this book. And we're going to, again, look at how the first church began. And and the reason I think that's important, and this is something we're passionate about in our staff and our team, is we really want to look at how the first church responded to things. What did they believe about Jesus? Because they were the closest to him. And you know this as well as I do. Once humans get involved in something, things change. And obviously the church looks a lot different than it did a couple thousand years ago. But that doesn't mean there still isn't an opportunity for us to learn from them. What did they do? How did they live out their faith each and every day? I think we have a lot to learn. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we'll be. Now I want to give you a little bit of context for what's happening. In the beginning of the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit falls. It descends on 
the people of God. And, and they start to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And so after that, Peter then gets up and he preaches a sermon. And, and it says that over 3,000 people were added to the church that day, which is incredible. It's really cool. They're starting to experience this power of the Holy Spirit. And so after this sermon is where we're going to pick up. And we're going to start in verse 42. And if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can follow along on the screen with us. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with all at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now I want to break down a few things from this passage. And notice that it begins with them devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And I got to admit, we do this well. I'm I'm always blown away that so many of you show up each and every week or tune in online each week and listen to our teaching. It's incredible. I would say the majority of us, um, either watching online or at church in the park, we, we do this well. You're devoted to those same things. You're so gracious to whoever's teaching, whoever's communicating or attempting to teach God's word. We take communion. We pray together. We do this really well. We've got this part down. And so uh, I'm not going to spend any more time on that. But as the text continues, I think it will challenge us a little bit more. It goes on to say that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now I want to pause and I want us to think about that for a moment. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Notice it says anyone. Anyone. It doesn't say those that were in their circle. It doesn't say those who they thought deserved it. No, anyone. And the word anyone gets at really the heart of what God is really about. The the most famous verse we see in all the scriptures is John 3.16, right? And it says, whoever or anyone who believes in God will not perish but have eternal life. Anyone. Scripture also says that God doesn't wish that anyone would perish, but that all would come to repentance, that all would receive eternal life. And this is where we as Christians, living out our faith in between Sundays, living out our faith every day, I think we can do a better job. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with Christians that play the whole who deserves it more game. We point fingers and we analyze what people are doing and how they're doing it. And if they check all the boxes that we want them to check, then sure, we will help out. No, that cannot be our attitude. That's not the heart of God. That should not be the posture of the church. We should meet the needs of anyone, period, anyone. There is no what if, there is no buts. Stop with that. The first church says, it said that they helped anyone with need and our posture has to be the same. And I think the reason they were so good at this is because they viewed people as image bearers of God first. And I think far too often we see people as their past, or how they vote, or the mistakes they've made, or how they're dressed, and a million other reasons, that's how we see them first, instead of image bearers of God. And it's a shame. And I pray that we can be the kind of church that sees all people 
anyone and everyone as people made in the image of God. In fact, I've spent the last couple years really developing some new core values. You know, we're celebrating 10 years as a church and after the look back at the past 10 years, what are some things that define us? But then also, what are some things that will define us for our next 10 years? And this idea really gets at one of our new core values. In fact, one of our new core values is this, that God made all people infinitely valuable. Let me say that again. God made all people infinitely valuable. And since all people are created in the image of God, they are deserving of our help no matter what, right? Let's keep going. It continues to say they ate bread in their homes, ate to, broke bread and ate together. And I love that. I love this part of the text because it says one of the things that the early church did was they shared meals together. They were in genuine community. Now, I might say something that'll step on your toes a little bit, but I think it's true. You can't just show up to church on Sunday or tune in online on a Sunday and not be in genuine community with believers any other day and really experience Christian community. You just can't do it. By jumping online or even attending one of our services, it's not enough. You don't get that, that, that sense of Christian community that, that the early church felt because they were breaking bread and eating meals together. There's a phrase that we used to say here at Rhythm all the time, and in fact, we've tweaked it a little bit because it's not completely true, I don't think. But we used to say this. We used to say that you can't grow spiritually unless you're connecting relationally. And while I think it's somewhat true, you, you might be able to grow spiritually without being connected with others, but we tweaked it. And, and in fact, this is another one of our new core values. I like this phrase a lot better. We grow best when we grow together. We grow best when we grow together. The first church did it, we need to do it. They got together, they shared meals, they laughed, they cried, they carried one another's burdens, they encouraged one another and built each other up. They were in genuine community with other believers and we have to do the same. Let's jump back in and look at the last verse and then we'll close. The last verse said, God added to their number, how often? Daily, those that were being saved. People were getting saved daily. And I love that people get saved at Rhythm on the weekends. That's super cool, but can you imagine how awesome it would be if, if people were entering into the kingdom of God daily because of our efforts, not just on the weekends, not just when somebody comes to church, but each and every day because of our love for people and the ways we're meeting the needs of those around us. That really is our job. Our job as a church is to be mission-minded. The job of the church is not to impact the church, but to impact the world. It's like a, a huddle in a football game. You know, football's starting back, and, you know, I think University of Iowa is going to get to play. And I love watching football, as probably do many of you. The reality is thousands of people don't pay, you know, whatever it is, $60 a ticket to watch a football team huddle up. I mean, imagine for a second if you went to a football game, and for two and a half or three hours, you watched 11 men stand in a circle and talk. That's not what you pay for right? The thousands of people that pay $60 a ticket, they do that to see what a difference the huddle makes. What they want to know is having called the play in secret, does it work in public? You see, the challenge for the church is not what we can do when we call our Sunday morning huddle, but what we do when we break our huddle to go do our job. That's the goal of the church. It's like we talked about a couple weeks ago. We're to go. We're to go to where the people are. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus did that. Jesus met people where they were, and I love that. And Jesus understood something that Christians today still don't seem to understand. And I love this about Jesus. And, and check this out. According to one count, the, the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, 
Luke, and John, the gospel accounts that we have. We have record of 132 contacts that Jesus had with people. Now check this out. Six of those 132 were in the temple. Four of those 132 were in the synagogues. 122 of the contacts he had with people were out in the mainstreams of life. I don't think that sunk in as it should. So I'm going to say that again. We have record of 132 interactions that Jesus had with people. Six of those were in the temple. Four of them were in the synagogues. 122 interactions were with people in the main streams of life. He went to where the people were, and we have to be doing the same. Church, we have to live it out. The goal of our faith is not to be here more. It's not to tune in more online. It's not to attend services more often. The goal is to be out there more. I'll close with this story because I think it helps illuminate some of the, the issues, the heart issue that we have sometimes as Christians. There was a guy who applied for a job at, at an, as an usher at a movie theater, local movie theater. And part of the interview process, the manager asked him, well, what would you do in case a fire breaks out? The young guy answered, well, don't, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. And, and that type of attitude is really how a lot of people would respond to the dying and lost world around them. If you asked them, <clears throat> what would you do if Jesus came back tomorrow? They would probably respond, oh, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. You see, but what we fail to remember is that you're an usher. You see, his job is, is to be an usher. It's, it's not enough just to get yourself out. You're responsible for helping show others the way. Jesus told his disciples 2,000 years ago to go, and he's telling us the same thing today, to go and make disciples. See, our job is to help usher people into the kingdom. It's not enough just to say, don't worry about me, I'll be okay. We have to usher others into the same kingdom that we're a part of. And the question is, are we willing to do it? Are we willing to put in the work? Are we willing to do more than just our 52 weeks a year? I pray that rhythm can be like the first church, helping anyone and everyone, gathering together in community, and seeing God add people to his kingdom daily because of our efforts. And I know that's a big prayer, but I think we can do it. If we get serious about going beyond the 52, if we get serious about living out our faith Monday to Saturday, that's my prayer for us. Let's pray for that together. God, I just want to thank you for what we see in the book of Acts. And, and the reality is that same power that same power of the Holy Spirit that fell on them then is the same power that we have access to today. And so, God, I pray that, that you today, right now, in this season of life, that you would add to your church daily because of how we're helping those around us, because of how we're gathering in community. And, God, I know you can do it. But God, I just pray we'd be willing to put forth the effort, that we'd be willing to open our hearts and allow your spirit to guide us and move us and change us and shape us, not just on Sunday, but every single day we wake up thinking, God, what do you want to do through me today? How can I advance your kingdom today? How can I live out my faith every day? God, I pray for that, and I pray that your spirit would empower us to do that. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 